Hello, and welcome to Meta25 Talks, where activists and organizers from the 25 political parties, Meta25 Greece, Meta25 Germany, and Meta25 Italy, get together to discuss some of the most urgent issues affecting the lives of people in each of those countries and what we can do to tackle them. Today, we talk about housing. Across Europe, the cost of housing has risen sharply in recent years, with many people struggling to find affordable and secure accommodation. This has led to a growing crisis with uh, more and more people facing the prospect of homelessness or precarious living conditions. We'll be exploring the root causes of this crisis, as well as examining both the unique and the common challenges facing Greece, Germany, and Italy. And we'll see what Matters 25 can do to help improve the lives of people across all those countries. Today, we're joined by uh, Johannes Fer from Matters 25 Germany, Federico Dolce from Matters 25 Italy, and Eric Edman from Meta25 Greece. Guys, welcome. Um, we'll start with you, I think, Johannes. Uh, can you give us a bit of an overview of how the housing crisis, if there is one, how it's looking in Germany at the moment and what Meta25 has been uh, up to on this issue? Thanks, Lucas. Uh, I think, yeah, the housing, housing crisis definitely exists here in Germany and especially in the bigger cities, of course, as I guess everywhere, the the problem is bigger. I live in Berlin, um, especially in Munich, Berlin, Hamburg, you know, the bigger cities, and then going down to the smaller scale, the, the problem, problem is huge. Lots of people are on the search for a house. Um, I've recently done this myself here in Berlin, and I can tell you that it's no fun um, running behind flats since you're one of many. <laughs> And there's the few that have the flats and they um, put high prices on them because they want to make a profit. That's kind of the, you know, the basic situation. And the problem is, of course, that it gets worse and worse. Um, that's why the people get more desperate um, all the time as well. And I actually looked up one data, which also said that the price of the ground, you know, the floor in, in Germany went up from around 8 euros and with 60 per square meter to about 200 euros per square meter today. Um, just, you know, I'm not boring you, will not bore you with many facts, but this is just um, what, uh, yeah, the, the average price has been. And of course, that's the average price for the whole country. That's not saying how much it is actually in the big cities. So, um, yeah, the, the problem is big. Um, also, from my personal experience, I've lived uh, in the last, uh, you know, flats that I've inhabited with uh, different uh, people together here in Berlin. I've lived in a, you know, in a in a company that was owned by a da uh, by a Danish oligarch, and that what was making money of it. I lived in a flat of an Austrian, uh, you know, company from the stock market. So this is kind of you know international money going into the to the city and trying to make as much profit from people that need a house uh, as they can. And maybe one one thing to actually add is that in Germany, it's particularly high that people are renting and not owning. You know, this is kind of like a tradition from the traditional or the, yeah, from the, the historical point of view. This is uh, why many people in Germany are not owning the house, and I actually that for you know very dependent on uh, on the on the price of the rent. Yeah, um, Germany does have uh, one of the the lower uh, rates of home ownership uh, among the the major countries in in Europe, which I think is a bit higher in um, Italy, for instance. But I think in Italy we're seeing. A lot of the same issues uh, for people who are renting, right, Fede? Yeah, exactly. Um, home ownership rates doesn't really solve by the, the crisis by itself because what we are experiencing here in Italy is that basically a generation was able to uh, invest in uh, building a house, housing. Um, buying their first house and maybe the second one and the third one uh, because uh, we got low interest rates or because we got in the past uh, very low uh, prices. 
Now everything has changed. Now uh, paying a mortgage or paying a rent takes up to two thirds of your salary. And therefore we got an entire generation and an entire uh, class of people that can no longer uh, afford it, basically. And what used to be perceived as a relative and small problem is now becoming a huge crisis because it's one of the most physical tool that the oligarchs are putting in place to uh, spread the inequality. Uh, here in Italy, we got uh, all, we always had a, a program for public housing that has always been very low funded and uh, has always been uh, way below the European uh, average. We got just 3.5% of the total houses that are actually into the program of public housing. They are old, they are malfunctioning, they are uh, very uh, low efficient from a ecological point of view and consumption point of view. That actually means that the poor um, people in needs that actually are in public housing pay way higher bills for electricity and heating. And uh, we are facing, due to more restrictive laws and uh, the economic crisis, we are on the verge of an uh, incredible surge in foreclosures. And uh, uh, we're talking about like uh, 150,000 people, families actually, that are facing eviction in the forthcoming months. This is a social bomb we going to explode. And so, yeah, uh, even though we do have an higher uh, ownership rate, that doesn't mean that we are not experiencing an uh, incredible raise in terms of rent and, uh, and uh, house prices in the bigger cities. Uh, we are suffering heavily gerrymandering in the, in the bigger cities, and we are having uh, heavily experiencing the Airbnb and the short rent phenomena as a certifies by rental agency as well. So this is not just a complaint from unions or from uh, uh, activists. This is a certified problem that we are facing right now in my country. Right. And Eric, I think kind of unique among us here, I mean, like Johannes mentioned, he had to move recently, but that was within Berlin where he already lived. But you actually moved uh, to Greece from a different country, right? Um, and so what what did that teach you uh, firsthand about <laughs> the current state of, of uh, uh, housing in Greece? Yeah, I mean, the first, <laughs> the, it's true what you said. I, I recently had to move back to Greece in preparation for the elections that we've got on the 21st of May now. And I found myself in the funny situation of uh, trying to find a place to stay in my hometown of Athens. And normally you would expect that it's Europeans talking to Greeks to find a place to stay. But in this case, it was I, a Greek, speaking to other Europeans to try to find a place to stay. Um, six or seven out of ten of the people that I was talking to do, uh, in order to rent a place in Athens were people from other European countries. It was Dutch, Austrians, uh, French. Uh, it was very rare that I would have to speak to somebody who's from here. And that is a sort of a side effect of the broader issue, which is the fact that since the economic crisis started in 2008, which hasn't stopped since for over a, a decade here, um, Greece has been one big uh, fire sale. It's uh, the entire country has been chopped up and sold off, whether it's to multinationals or small scale investors, be it your friendly elderly couple from Austria who had some money lying around and bought some property in Greece or whether it's some big um, uh, real estate agents from, from, from foreign uh, nations that have been investing um, in the country it makes no difference. The actual result for the local population is uh, gentrification, 
uh, it's impossible rents. It's the fact that entire neighborhoods are being transformed into tourist destinations uh, without any of the basic services that you would expect from your neighborhood, like a supermarket or a dry cleaners or a, a bakery. But instead, you've got uh, you know cinemas and bars and restaurants. So that's just driving people away from historical neighborhoods where people have lived um, and into the outskirts, it, both because the, the neighborhoods are unlivable, but also because uh, the, the prices are impossible. So that's one of the first things that you notice. Um, and the other is the prices themselves. Uh, in, in, in Greece, the minimum wage is under 800 euros. Uh, they've raised it now to something like 780 euros per month. Uh, but you're still looking at uh, rents of upwards of five or 600 euros if you want to stay in the city. Um, so in general, you see that the, the fact that for the last few years, we've had a complete lack of social policy in Greece, something that was decided by the troika of, uh, of lenders um, to completely scrap any kind of social policy, whether it's social housing, uh, rent uh, uh, caps or whatever else have you, um, th the result is uh, catastrophic for the local population. Um, and I had to experience that firsthand myself when, when I moved here last month. Yeah. Uh, one of the, th the things that struck me the most about Greece is that 75% uh, there are of the population who rent, so the percentage of, of tenants, spend more than 40% uh, of their income on rent, which is just a, a staggering proportion of people, uh, one of the highest rates, if not the highest rate in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but to, to stay with you for a second, Eric, because uh, obviously, you know, we're basically on the eve of uh, elections over there in Greece, uh, in, in which we are uh, running naturally as, as Meta25, we've been in parliament for, for four years now. Um, what uh, have been the proposals and are currently the proposals uh, of uh, Meta25 uh, for, for housing? How do we solve this, essentially? There's a number of things that you can do. Uh, first of all, what you mentioned, 75% of uh, people who pay rent pay something like 40% of their income. Those are the people who are actually renting. Um, a huge part, especially of young people, uh, don't live uh, independently. They live with their parents. In fact, I think the average uh, age of people moving out of their family homes has now increased to something like 35 years old, uh, which is incredibly high, even by... Uh, the standards of the Greek patriarchal system where people anyway would have moved out uh, later compared to their um, northern and western European counterparts. But it's simply because uh, people can't afford to do so. M my brother, for example, uh, is one of those people. Um, what you can do, though, in order to combat what's going on, you need to break a few eggs because it's not that governments are unaware of what is happening is not that uh, this is a policy mistake. Uh, it is the fact that they maintain the current policies because they blindly serve certain political and economic interests, um, namely those of foreign investors who buy up property in the country. Uh, and that is essentially the, the result of the Troika uh, policies of the memoranda of the past few years, which our governments have bent the knee to and that's the, the the line that Brussels is pushing, um, or whether it's or, or it's the uh, the local oligarchs, the the Greek uh, bigwigs, um, who are also uh, similarly speculating and, and buying up huge pieces of, uh, of of property, not just houses. For example, we have the uh, the old Athens airport uh, in an area called Eleniko, um, the biggest uh, piece of. Uh, land owned by the state uh, anywhere in the country. And uh, that was recently sold to a Greek oligarch, Latsis, who was a ship owner, uh, for peanuts, uh, because supposedly he was going to invest in it and create all sorts of uh, investment opportunities uh, for the nation, and jobs and, and what have you. Uh, but instead, what he's done is cut it up and sold plots of land uh, to uh, rich foreign oligarchs from Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the rest of it, who are then going to use them to, to, to build luxury apartments. 
this is what you're seeing everywhere in Europe. It's not a, a Greek phenomenon. It's uh, this kind of 1% uh, money exchange uh, th that is completely destroying uh, policy and um, housing policy. Uh, so le let me come to the solutions. First of all, what you need to do is a return of social housing policy. So instead of putting this idea of investment at any cost uh, and, and, and zeros, instead of seeing where those zeros end up, uh, that's the first thing that, that needs to change. You need policy whereby these kind of uh, the, the housing uh, investment that is being done uh, results in uh, social housing, which uh, then returns back to the people. You need major investment in retrofitting um, current uh, plots of, uh, well, not plots of land, but current apartments here in Athens to make them sustainable, both in terms of the green transition, uh, but also energy efficiency and the rest of it, which has both social and environmental uh, effects. You need uh, to cap the uh, amount of apartments that are allowed to be uh, put up for, for rent through platforms like Airbnb, which are gentrifying entire neighborhoods. Uh, and you need a limit on a foreign investment in, in, in real estate and housing. Uh, those are all things that are imminently doable. Uh, but what needs to happen in order to implement these policies is to come into conflict with the kind of big interests that Brussels and our current governments uh, are, are supporting. Yeah, I think the, the, this first point that you mentioned is a, is, is a very salient one, which is the, the, I think everybody agrees that we need more housing. But um, if, you, if you just unleash inv private investment like that, then what you're going to get is uh, luxury condos. It's not going to be uh, social affordable housing because that's where the money is at, right? That's a... Uh, that's how we squeeze the most profit out of um, the, a large investment, like building, a, you know, like it's a, a, an apartment building or something like that. Um, Johannes and, uh, and Fede, what uh, what eggs are Mer25 in uh, Germany and uh, Italy looking to to break to to sort this out? To start with you, Johannes, because it's not only in Greece that we're on the eve of elections, but also uh, in Germany, Mer25. Um, is about to run in its first elections ever at the state level in uh, in Bremen. Yeah, exactly. Um, Bremen, beautiful city on the north coast of Germany. For those uh, who don't know it, uh, maybe worth a visit in the next weeks to help us campaign. Um, in Bremen, as you know, that is now the obvious example, but similar, you know, things exist in in general in Germany. And there's two big housing companies that I want to take as an example. There's first Bonovia, which is um, uh, an international, a European company, <laughs> um, where you already see as, you know, with the examples I mentioned before, you cannot tackle this, this um, problem only on the national level because the companies are international companies. This is the biggest German housing companies. They own over half a million flats. Um, and they are, you know, a stock market company that tries to make as much money as they can. They are, you know, owned by lots of people from around the world and uh, capital hedge funds and so on. BlackRock, of course, has uh, quite some share. And um, also the no Norwegian State Fund has some quite some share. So Norwegian State Fund making money from German um, rents to, you know, uh, to... <laughs> enhance the pension fund there. This is also like a pretty crazy idea to invest um, since it's this way uh, to make profit. Um, but back to Bremen, this is one of the big companies there, so international company. Um, and our solution is to go to the core of the problem. And the core of the problem is the ownership. Of course, we also support rent caps, more taxes on these kinds of companies on an international level uh, with our international approach. But very important is also to look at who's owning what and how are they running things. So um, I think our um, idea is to actually go head on with these kind of companies and put expropriate them, expropriate the the, the flats that are in these kind of um, uh, private hands that only try to squeeze money out of it, to actually put it in public ownership where there's no motive for profit, but just the motive for making good living conditions for people, affordable, 
and uh, very important also in nowadays times to um, try to you know renovate in a way that it's actually run um, without destroying the climate. Um, so we have warm um, houses in winter in Germany without uh, burning uh, fossil fuels. And for that, it's also really important to understand what the difference between us and the current political um, centrist parties who are also um, governing in Bremen is because the other big company um, that is having a lot of flats in Bremen is called Gebova and is owned by 75% by the state of Bremen. And it is still run to make profit. So, you know, state owned doesn't really mean that it is, you know, a social, that is necessarily a social policy down there. I guess it's a little bit better than the international hedge fund. But in this example, you can see, and I recently saw an interview with the mayor of Bremen defending this and um, saying, yeah, you know, you need to make a little bit of profit at least. And I think. For us, it's very clear with Meta 25 that we want to put an end to that. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what you get when you when you self-impose a debt break on just about everything, right? Which is a, a common feature of German politics, not only at the federal level but also on the state levels. Um, even even the public goods have to turn a profit at the at the end of the day. Fadit, same question to you and uh, Meta 25 in in Italy. Yeah, we're looking at. Uh, slightly more dreadful situation. So first thing we're trying to do is to fight locally to stop the evictions, like a last minute uh, tragedy avoiding thing, because what we're facing is something extremely dangerous. Like we're talking about hundreds of thousands of families out on the streets and more, many of them will actually lose their work if they cannot live within the city. So. Usually, a uh, complex problem requires complex, complex solutions. And I think housing, as basic as it is, because it's a bad need, is one of the most complex problems that we might face because it involves finance, high level finance, and basic need, and uh, the very mess of our society when there are the homeless. And in that view, uh, one of our approach, of course, will try will be try to implement a change of the laws that actually makes extremely appealable and uh, to to invest into becoming landlords uh, as a way to diversify in your high uh, income, and uh, because this is one of our major issue, the complete inequalities among a certain uh, percentage of, of people that actually uh, can afford two or three houses, can afford to leave them empty. We do have up to 7% of our uh, houses uh, completely inhabited and empty because it's more convenient for the owners to live in, in that, live that, in, the, in that state. And we are facing huge difficulties with something that is a city level policy, the house uh, managing uh, and the public house managing, but also the regulation on plans for the city development, because even the most progressive mayors are putting in place strong uh, gentrifying policies because it actually helps in terms of money for them, in terms of taxes. And they are uh, thirsty for uh, for funds because the general, the station, the, the state level government completely cut all the funds to the to the municipalities. So they are willing to uh, manage the cities with no planning, no perspective, and just turn uh, to the to the market to have some little money in order to maintain uh, the the general expenses. We need planning. We need planning on a larger scale. We cannot leave this to the cities. We need uh, a broader vision and uh, a broader action uh, because this is one of our, is, is becoming one of our main concern for the future. I just wanted to uh, jump in quickly to add something because Feder touched on evictions. Um, 
which are kind of, you know, and homelessness, of course, which are kind of these very grave um, and horrible examples of our, you know, the kind of general, you know, thought in which mainstream politics is done today. Because I think for us, um, and I think I, I can speak for everyone here, is housing is just a human right, right? You don't throw someone on the streets. And also, you don't let someone live on the streets. This should be obvious, I think, for, you know, every society. And, and I think it is for many people. Many people would support this. But unfortunately, um, the governing politics uh, in this day and age doesn't. So that's why we are here. And that's why we want to change that to just say, you know, every um, housing first, every, you know, homeless person has the right to have a house. And as Peter also said, and I think that's the same in Germany, as many empty houses where people bought a house and then they're just waiting for it, you know, to raise in price because they, they can also sell it. And with a higher profit, there's no one living there. Um, or they wait for people to actually go out to, to be able to renovate the whole house and then sell it at a higher price. And this just needs to be, especially with housing, which is something that is, you know, scarce. Um, we cannot run it on a profit model. Um, and we just need to run it on a very social, reasonable model of people coming together and deciding how they want to live and um, who does what and how, how we are going to build uh, our houses and do our architecture so that there's space for everyone. Sorry, can I jump in? If I can also... Yes, better go. Go. Oh, no, sorry. And I'll, I'll come in as well. Because it's, it's not really a, a scarce good. It's a rare good. Like we're not growing in numbers that big. We just have a huge disproportion of distribution. Like this is something that we are managing so bad because we gave up. And, and as you said, it, it's one of our basic needs. And together with jobs, it's one of the most ramping failures that the market gave us in the past 20 to 30 years. Like the whole society in the, in, in the very fundamental is, is crumbling down because we just gave up trying to manage it and control it and, and, and planning for ourselves. So that's just it. Bender really touched on a raw nerve here with these evictions. Uh, I, 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 it's a very good point. We, we also, it's a huge issue here in Greece. And it's such an excellent example of how the entire system is not designed rationally. It's not designed in order to serve people's needs uh, the way people who promote the market sort of as a, as, as a solution to everything um, propagate. But instead, in order to drive profits, and it doesn't matter how those profits are distributed, if they end up in the pockets of three people, and result in the suffering of the vast majority of society, then so be it. It doesn't matter. Profit is king. Uh, and this is what you're seeing. Because here with the economic crisis in Greece, we obviously ended up having a huge amount of unserviceable debt. Uh, when people lost their jobs, their, their sources of income, everything just collapsed and people had mortgages that they could no longer service. What happened? that these the banks who held those loans, those mortgages, ended up selling them to uh, investment funds from the United States, from Delaware, from the Cayman Islands, from wherever have you, from New Jersey, um, for a fraction of the amount owed. So if, if somebody had a, let's say, 300,000 euro mortgage, the bank would take that loan. It doesn't matter how much money they would have gotten back from that person. They might have gotten half the money or even 70% of the money back. They would take that loan and sell it on to one of these funds for a tiny fraction, sometimes 10% of the amount of the loan. So 30,000 euros. So the banks would get 30,000 euros. They would have ended up losing a huge amount as a result. Um, and then those funds who bought it for 30,000 euros would be um, eligible to get all 300,000 back from the people that still owe that money. So it's a huge um, profit margin that these funds get. Instead of offering the people who have those loans the same right, so if that bank is, is selling that loan for 10% of the price, why doesn't the person who has that loan have the same right to pay it off? 
if an investment fund from Delaware can get that uh, debt for 30,000 euros, why shouldn't a citizen? That would make sense. But we're not running our societies. We're not running our democracies for the interests of citizens. We're running it for the interests of investment bankers. That's what we're doing. Um, and it's absolutely appalling. It, these kinds of things that we need to be pushing out into the social, into the, into the common discussion, um, into society, because people are just not aware. We're still running off this illusion that our governments are, at the end of the day, um, through the market, through capitalism, still serving our interests. But they're not. We're very, very far away from that kind of um, capitalism with a social face. We that train has left the station years ago. And what is happening um, is the absolute plundering of, uh, of, 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 um, uh, of public ownership and of people's uh, investments and of people's property everywhere in Europe and essentially everywhere in the world. You know, and uh, what, what, what scares me the most, Eric, to be honest, for what you said, which, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a horrible, is a horrible thing to have to hear, you know, to know that it's happening is that I think, especially for younger people, it might not even sound that strange to them because, uh, we don't really know, um, um, and I say we, cause you know, we're all relatively younger, young ish here. Uh, we we don't we, we don't know anything else. Uh, we were born at, at a time which was really the the first time ever in, in in human history, really, in which housing is treated as you know uh, anything else that you might uh, trade in in the stock market. Um, it's not we're so we've dissociated ourselves from the concept of housing being a public good so much because we again we don't know anything else. Um, that it's 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 hard to reclaim it, but it's a fundamental thing that we have to do because uh, for the mere, for the for the simple fact that it is a public good, it is it is essential, it is as essential as uh, healthcare, um, as uh, education, and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but the question that I wanted to turn to now is, we're talking a lot about uh, you know rampant speculation and um, you know. Uh, foreign uh, companies and investment funds coming into housing markets, um, buying up a bunch of the stock um, and then, uh, you know, squeezing every ounce of profit there is to, to, to square off of it, to, to squeeze off of it. And then um, in, in a lot of cases, then just selling that on to, to a different invest foreign investment fund um, at a massive profit for them to go into the same thing. Um, and this is happening in, in, in Greece. This is happening in Germany. This is happening in Italy. Um, so it's an European trend, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and how do we how do we tackle this? Because one of the unique things, of course, about uh, Meta 25 and about Team 25 is that we we don't we don't care about borders. We we care as much as about about borders as those investments uh, funds and, and and corporations do, um, which is I think, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, something that's essential in order to in order to fight back here. Um, so the question now is, how do we fight back? What are some of the measures that uh, need, that really require uh, solutions at the transnational level? So if you think about the European Union, for example, maybe EU policy, uh, but also just uh, maybe bilateral co uh, cooperation uh, amongst uh, national governments um, in order to, to solve them. Um, I don't know who wants to, to go first in, in, uh, in tackling this. I can, if, if the other two guys don't mind, I can start. Um, there's a couple of things here. First of all, the late David Graeber used to um, always say, everything can be different. And he was a sociologist. What he knew is that human society has gone through a multitude of phases and a multitude of sort of common hysterias and common legends and myths that we tell ourselves about how the world is and how it's ordained to be and how those things can never change and um to, to, to at the risk of maybe using too many quotes there, there's another one that i really like by ursula Le Guin, who who you who wrote in one of her books that we live at the age of capitalism and its uh, power seems inescapable but so too once seen the divine power of kings. So the big, the biggest fight that we have ahead of us 
And that is a common fight everywhere in the world, let alone Europe. And the commonality that we have through the European Union is to fight this idea that nothing can change, that this is the system we've got and it's got winners and it's got losers, but it's the best we've got. So we might as well just, you know, bend the knee to it and get on with it and make the best of it that we can. What we are seeing more and more, especially with uh, the environmental crisis, but in general, you know, you see society at a boiling point. I think France is an excellent example of this right now, uh, is that we're getting to this kind of crossroad where it's becoming increasingly obvious that A, this system is actually not working at all. Uh, it's not that, you know, it's not great, but at least it's working. It doesn't even work. It doesn't even do the bare minimum. Um, whether it's because of the environment or because socially it's, it's left us completely um, at the mercy of, of the rich and powerful. Um, but also we're coming to that point where people are willing to consider the fact that things could be very different. Um, and it's the only thing stopping us from making them incredibly different is us um, and how we react to, to where we're at. Uh, this idea of a Europe that uh, is prospering, that is well off, and all it needs to do is tweak uh, its its current policy, um, is dying as a narrative. It's and that is one of the main reasons why the far right is doing as well as it is in Europe. And that's a open space for also the left to to develop into instead of doing what uh, social democrats would be doing across the continent, which is to double down, to turn ever more conservative and to try and conserve a system that is A, not um, in keeping with their own former ideology, which they'd given up on a long time ago, um, and also doesn't serve the people that uh, they used to represent in politics. And, and that's the space that uh, the left needs to develop into occupying and, and not giving up to, to the far right. The other thing is that exactly because everything could be different, the same goes for the European Union. The European Union could be incredibly different. We have the European Union that we have allowed our governments to create. It is a European Union that essentially acts as a broker for certain uh, political interests, whether they are of the most powerful countries in Europe or the most powerful economic interests in the world makes a little difference. Uh, but that is how it's been designed, instead of securing the interests of the citizens of the European Union. In order for the EU to change, however, we need a, bro a broad front uh, across the entire continent that can represent this um, political will for change, both at the national level, where those, you know, um, that position needs to be cemented in the minds and hearts of, of people, of voters, but then also elevated to the European level from that national level. It's, it's at the same time a national and a European fight. And to give a very concrete example of, of why it's a, a European fight, um, the, the, the current financial crisis that is brewing, that started with the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, who spread to Europe through Credit Suisse and, and the rest of it, um, it is at the same time not like 2008 and exactly like 2008. The biggest difference is that bankers are not afraid this time around. Back in 2008, they were terrified of what's going to happen. This time, they're not. Because our central banks everywhere in the world, including the European Central Bank, have told them for the past decade that no matter what happens, they're going to bail them out. It doesn't matter how badly they mess up. It doesn't matter how, uh, how many risks they take and how they misappropriate, misappropriate the, 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 the funds that they have from your average Joe, you, you and I. Um, they will always get bailed out. These are the kind of policies that we could be fighting. And th the kind of money that are being printed in order to bail out these banks could, for example, be created in order to finance the, gre the, the green transition that we need that will create jobs, that will create the kind of sustainability that we need in our societies, in our economies, um, in order to make uh, all of our countries and the entire continent, and by extension, hopefully the world eventually, uh, future-proof, um, instead of just shoveling these endless amounts of cash uh, into the black hole that is the parasitic uh, banking system. So it, it, it's about really shifting the political debate about from this um, fatalistic this is the way the world is, this is the way the EU is, this is the way governments work, um, and towards 
unlocking that part of our brain of, that is both creative and ambitious about the future uh, and realize that there's actually quite a few things that we could change that aren't even that radical. All, all it requires is to decouple our governments from these parasitic oligarchic interests uh, that we've blindly been um, uh, serving for these past uh, few decades. I think I, I agree with what, what Eric just said. And I was just thinking before on, on what uh, the, on the Eric proposal for allowing people to actually uh, buy back the, with the 10% and having the same uh, treatment that you're already giving to hedge funds. And it took me two seconds to picture in my mind the headlines in newspaper and, 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 and newscasts like uh, the lazy bailout or uh, how comfy, how about me who paid the whole mortgage? Why can why can they be allowed to pay just 10%? So yeah, the thing is public debate and, and what we are allowing ourselves to think must be changed because we are so deep in this mindset where we are completely okay with allowing hedge funds that are, as you, uh, well said, completely ruling our reality at the present, at the moment. And we are constantly victim blaming everyone who needs, because that's one way to deal with the struggle, one way to deal with the, 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 the reality. It's like individual's fault and not the society that, that's crumbling down. So I think that the European approach is not the right approach because yeah, free money from Europe. It's not like that. It's not like the European approach would be way more effective, which it will be, but it's because it would allow ourselves to start in imagining once again, what the society must be, what we would like, what we would dream our future to be, because at the moment it looks like we gave up on that dream. We're just accepting and, and trying to survive in uh, something that it's not working, as you said. So uh, a way to be more effective, a way to put back again everything on the table and start debating on what we need as a society and what it's right and what it's fair and what our future is going to look like because that future is going to came whether we want it or not. Yeah, it's it come for sure. <laughs> Maybe it's already here. Um, I wanted to to pick on the French protests that Eric mentioned just now happening. Actually, just resisting um, to you know uh, the pension age actually going up even more in France, um, and just resisting everything even getting worse, um, which of course has our full support and solidarity as in DMRs in France are also on the streets resisting this. This is an example where I don't know about, you know, every German, uh, every European media landscape, but in the German one, for sure, you don't read much about this. You know, you don't read much about the uprise of whole, you know, population against their government in the center of Europe. And this draws me, drives me back a little bit to um, our common experience also from different angles about what happened in 2008 and after the Greek Spring, the, the countries uh, and the populations in Southern Europe voting for more left governments and those governments immediately being under big pressure from, um, from the, you know, the center of Europe and the powerful um, institutions and also, you know, media and public opinion in Germany being shifted against the so-called lazy Greeks and so on and all this other bullshit. This is something that we as an international um, organization, and that's why DM25 was set up after this experience, can fight much better than if you're just a national party. Um, and I think that's the core why we have a better chance to actually, if, you know, we make it to the government somewhere and we'll try everything um, to implement some of the policies that uh, we discussed today, that we can then actually 
Because if we do radical um, changes in the political system and um, in the ownership of housing, for example, of course, we can bet on being under huge attacks um, from those interests that own the media, own the housing, that don't want this change to happen. And then we need to we need the support of the people, and we don't need to. So, um, and it's much better if you don't have that actually in one state um, only, but you know across borders uh, across Europe. And I think that's the unique thing for me. Why now also in Bremen in the local election we are competing for the new housing solidarity as we call it there in our campaign. And um, actually, I also want to link in the description of a video a petition that we have against evictions specifically in Bremen. So everyone watching this can um, hopefully sign it, and especially those um, that are in Germany and uh, maybe even in Bremen, also you know, a call out to, to join our campaign there. And we'll do that also um, canvassing with people from outside Germany, from, um, from Portugal, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, uh, from other countries coming, uh, even from Montenegro, coming to Bremen and campaigning there for a policy that, you know, we want to implement everywhere. Um, and I think that's the kind of uh, unique approach of Manor 25. And that's why we are doing this, not just, you know, in one country. Yeah. And uh, I think yeah. on that on that note of international solidarity, we're going to wrap up. I uh, want to thank again the three of you for joining us. Uh, thank you for watching, of course. Uh, now we would like to hear from you. Um, if you have any thoughts, comments, please uh, leave them down below. Um, if you have any personal stories uh, related to housing that uh, you've you've had in the recent past or in the distant past, uh, please share, that with, uh, share them with us. Um, and if you have any suggestions for which topic we should tackle next as well, uh, we'd like to hear from you on that. Um, if you haven't joined DM25, uh, the link will be in the description. Um, if you happen to live in uh, Greece, in Germany, or in Italy, and you'd like to get active also with Meta25 in your country, those links will also be on the description. Um, and lastly, of course, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and to subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. And Thanks again to you guys and we'll see you next time.